Hey, everybody. Wake up, wake up. Come on in here. I know it's early, but you can do it. Grab your beverage. It's time for a simultaneous sip for the people who are here quickly. The people who are on the ball with their beverage and their their devices. Here it comes. Oh, that's good stuff. Hello, Bangkok. Yes, the simultaneous sip is the best sip of all. So in Twitter this morning, on Twitter, do you say in Twitter or on Twitter? Somewhere on Twitter, uh, James Woods um, had an interesting question. And James Woods said, why is it that his liberal friends hate President Trump with the white-hot hatred you would normally only see for a jilted lover? And I like the way he put it. He said, why do people hate him not like you normally hate a politician, not like you just hate the person who's on the other side, not the way you'd hate somebody you thought was incompetent, they don't hate him in any of those normal ways. The hatred for President Trump is is a full body, makes you shake, makes you sweat kind of hatred, like something you've never seen before. Um, I mentioned this a long time ago, <clears throat> but during the election, I was at a restaurant and there was a uh, a table within earshot, in which there was a a woman talking about the potential of a candidate Trump becoming President Trump. And when she talked about him, she actually shook. Her body actually shook and her and her uh, her words, you know, were kind of broken like uh, but you know, President Trump could become president. And it was a a full body like real fear. Not the kind of political fear you have. It's like, well, I'm afraid of taxes going up or Something like that. It was a real one. It was like a monster chasing you kind of a fear. <clears throat> and so, James Wood's question is, why? You know, what? Where does that come from when you know, half of the country doesn't feel it, but half does? Now let's get rid of this guy. <clears throat> and... So I wanted to weigh in with my opinion on why it is that people feel this unusual fear of President Trump more so than a regular politician. Yeah, you can see it. If you look at the guests on CNN, if you look at Cory Booker, um, you know, a number of them, they, they actually are shaking with fear and, and hatred. And here's my explanation. Let me start with the definition of Charisma. So the definition, sort of the scientific definition of charisma, is somebody who has both of these qualities. So you're charismatic if you have power of some sort, doesn't matter what kind of power. You have power and you have empathy, but you have to have both. Now think about it. If you had power but no empathy, it would be like a monster just walked into your room. Because the monster could kill you like that. Because the monster has power. But the monster doesn't care about you. doesn't care if you live or die. So one wrong move, bam, the monster kills you. So if you see somebody who has power, but they do not de- demonstrate empathy, that's the scariest person you can have in your world. Um, you know, and to go through the other combinations... Uh, what is it... Uh, What's up with all the weird trolls today? So the other combination are somebody who has no power and no empathy is irrelevant to you because they have no power over you. It doesn't matter that they also don't care about you. So a street person might not care about you, but they also have no power over you. So you don't really, you're not afraid of them unless you're in a bad neighborhood. Um, And if somebody has empathy, yeah, And if somebody has power and they have empathy, well, then you say, whoa, that's the best leader ever. They care about me and they have the power to do something about it. So the trouble with President Trump's approach, his America first approach, in which he does not 
try to call out different ethnic groups. He does not try to call out, you know, gender. I mean, he does in a in the sort of a Republican way, but he doesn't focus on those things. It creates it creates the impression that he has great power because he became rich, he became president. That's about as much power as you can have. But people say, well, he does have empathy because he talks about um, police, he talks about wounded veterans, he talks about the unborn, you know, abortion. But here's the problem. If you're not in one of those groups, <laughs> you don't feel like his empathy is aimed at you. Right? It feels like, oh, well, I would have to be in like the military to get some empathy, or I would have to be an unborn fetus to get some empathy. What about me? Now, he does also have empathy, apparently, for the yeah, the so-called forgotten men and women, the, the, the blue-collar workers, the, uh, the Rust Belt people, the, the, the paycheck people. Uh, he does seem to have empathy for that group. But apparently it's not enough, right? Because imagine if you are um, black or brown. Just take this one example. Let's say you're black or brown and you're in Trump's America. And you're watching him not show any empathy for your your category because you consider yourself black or brown and maybe that's your dominant uh, that's your dominant category, the way you think of yourself in America. And he never says anything about you. But then when the Charlottesville thing happens, he goes, well, there's some fine people there. You're like, what the hell? There's fine people among the white supremacists? But what about my group? Now, he didn't actually say that about Charlottesville. But the media made it sound like he was talking about the white supremacists themselves as being fine people. There's no way in hell he was talking about the white supremacists being fine people. Obviously, he thought other people were there as well, but they weren't. So he just had a wrong fact. But the media very easily takes his his comments, his inelegant comments, and turns them into, see, I told you he hates the brown people. Um, so there's a combination of the media, uh, backed by very powerful cognitive um, scientists, originally anyway, who came up with the narrative that he was against brown people, basically, and against women. And it was kind of sticky, because it was designed by experts, persuasion experts, and they brainwashed you know, a fairly large segment of the population to think that he didn't like them. So you first, the first thing you have to think is that it's not so important of what uh, the president did, I wonder why there's so many of these, huh? It's not so. It's not simply what the president does. It's also what his his opposition does. And what his opposition did was a really good job of painting him as being powerful but not empathetic. So when they paint that picture, that's a scary, scary, scary picture. Now you'll hear lots of other explanations for why people hate the president. But I think it's that plus this. There, There is one group who I think, um, <laughs> if you imagine the country is separated into sort of two groups, and here I'm not talking about ethnicity or gender, but one group is fairly confident about their their ability to succeed. In other words, there's one group that says, well, All the tools are here. All I need is an education or to work hard, and I can make something out of this life. There's another group of people who are pretty sure that their success or failure or happiness does not have to do with their own actions. That is something that other people do, and if the other people would stop stop doing the wrong things, the bad things, then they could be happy and successful too. So if you believe that your success is under your own control, you're more likely to say, yeah, President Trump works for me. He's just clearing away some of the the debris. He's getting rid of some of the regulations that were in my way, and he's lowering my taxes. But ultimately, it's up to me. It's up to me if I make something out of this. 
those people tend to be happy because they feel a sense of control and agency and they've got a plan and all the, all the components are in place for them to move towards success even if they're not there. But if you think that your success depends on what other people do, then you're not going to be happy if the other person is not doing something for you. <laughs> it's, going to look, it's going to look like it's a big threat. <laughs> Save it, cultist. Well, keep in mind that President Obama had a, a, a somewhat similar level of hatred from the other side. And the reason he had that hatred is for exactly the same reason. People saw him as having power, but not empathy for their group. So if you think some, if you thought Obama was powerful because he was the president, and he had empathy for, let's say, lots of empathy for women and black people and brown people, but if you were not one of those, there's a good chance you said, hey, where's his empathy for me? I hate that guy. So it's the same argument for both men. The short word for this is tribalism. Yeah, that's not that's not too far off. Yeah, the the Trump frame on things is that he sees the world as winners and losers. And within his frame of the world as winners and losers, he is trying to make his team, Team America, the ones who are winners. So he is trying to make everybody winners. But if you don't feel like a winner and you're in Trump's America, you're not going to feel like he loves you because he loves winners. (laughs) And then there are some people who say Trump is just feeding his ego. Some people say he's just a narcissist. That's really just another way of saying that he has power because that's obvious, he's president, but he doesn't have empathy. When you say somebody is just feeding their own ego, it's another way of saying that they don't care about you. So that was my point. My point is he doesn't have empathy for all of the groups in America, uh, even though he has empathy for certain groups, you know, uh, veterans, for example, the unborn, for example. Um, He has... You know, plenty of empathy for um, the the paycheck folks in the in the rest belt, for example. Not just empathy; he lacks morals. Well, morals would be a constraint that would protect you. So, if you imagine that there was a a strong leader, and that strong leader. Uh, It's really weird that somebody's doing that today. The Whoever the uh, troll is is very dedicated today. <clears throat> I'll block them when they come back. Apparently it's going to be a thing today. Uh, anyway, ego and empathy, and empathy are very related. If you think somebody is an egomaniac, you are also thinking that they don't care about you that they only care about themselves. So empathy really is the the key. It just comes out in different ways and different words. Now, my understanding is, yeah, as somebody was saying here, that in person, Trump is quite empathetic. Uh, and he has different personalities for different contexts. And he's, he seems to have chosen the the strength a persuasion. In other words, the, the president is going for power as his primary persuasion. The, and then in, in place of empathy, for the most part, he's using a team framing. So he's not saying, I care about this group more than this group. He's saying, we're on a team, and I'm going to care about my team more than all the other teams. So to the extent that he can sell that idea, it does help him with his empathy problem. But if you're one of the people who you just don't think he's on your team, even though you're an American, you're going to be pretty mad at him. Q 
can't sell outside his base. Well, he hasn't tried. So whoever said that um, that Trump can't sell outside his base, keep in mind that he went from about a 10% approval within his base, in other words, within Republicans, from about 10% to about 80%. So he's improved by a factor of eight within the first group you have to have to convince. Once he's got his team on his side, he can do stuff like tax reform or he just needs one side to vote. And you see him already starting to reach across and talk bipartisanship for things that he'll need to convince the other side for. So we're in a world where the primary thing you want to do is convince your own side. It's not really a world where you convince the other side anymore. You you hope to pull off some independence, but you don't really convince the other side. That's just not a thing anymore. <clears throat> yeah, Doc is obviously reaching across. So there's a lot of compromise in DACA. There's a lot of compromise in the budget bill. So the budget that just got passed is certainly not a Republican budget. Uh, <laughs> All right, my nose is so stuffed up that I can't talk anymore. So I'm going to bail out now, and I'm going to...